Hi, everyone. I'm David Brommer. I'm your host for Optic. Welcome to the show. This is our third and last webinar in our series. We have a very special guest. I'm happy to report I got to host Anna Vanderwall here at B&H Photo in the event space many years ago and is a really cool guy who has a really interesting presentation. Before we begin, I just want to remind everyone that Optic West officially starts in just a couple of days this Sunday. It's going to all be going, it's all going to be starting. So we're, we're very excited here at B&H and uh, various members of the team are going to be departing and traveling to, to Monterey to do the pre-show setups, and get things ready for everybody. Please keep Keep an eye on your Eventbrite RSVP emails coming in. I've been sending many messages out to everybody. Those are going to continue as we speak right now. I've been writing an FAQ that's going to answer all your possible questions you can have, and you should get ready for this amazing show. It's really going to be incredible. Uh, it's another special announcement for you. Uh, Anna Vanderwall is a Canon Explorer of Light. Canon will be doing a cleanup and check of cameras at the show. So anyone who has a Canon EOS camera, feel free to bring that to the show and Canon will actually be doing a clean and check up for you. A great way to end your year after using your camera so well. So this is a very special presentation from on uh, Anna is actually, uh, believe it or not, is giving the presentation from the Snow Goose. Uh, he's in the middle of a trip from New England down to the Bahamas. Uh, he's going to give you a slide for his social media if you want to follow Anna along this journey and this amazing trip. And why this is a special presentation is that very often we think of optic as as being bird photography and lions and tigers and bears and amazing landscapes. Or when we talk about water, we think about sharks and whales. Well, this is a little bit different. This is being able to capture the sense of place above the water. Uh, this is going to be on the docks. This is going to be on the high waters, the high seas. Anna has spent a lifetime shooting yachts uh, for boat manufacturers, and he's been all over the world's oceans sh shooting amazing looking ships to give a sense of place for the open seas. So let's get ready to get salty with Anna Vanderwall. Anna, you can turn on your camera and let, let's see you aboard the Snow Goose. Right, here we are. Hi, David. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. Thank so you. good to see you again. Thank you. All right, well, listen, we, we've got a load of people here on the YouTube watching this. I'm, I'm coming live from New York City, as you can see behind me. It's a, it's a little bit of a rainy day. And, and what, what state are you in? Where, where are you now? I'm in Virginia. Uh, in Norfolk, and the temperature outside is 72 degrees, so it's lovely. A beautiful fall day. Okay, we've got yeah. just shy of 300 people watching, so I'm going to turn this over to you. Uh, we're going to ask for the audience. Uh, you can drop your questions into the YouTube chat, and we'll either interrupt on in the middle of this presentation, or we're going to get your questions in the end. So thank you for attending today, and Anna, take it away. Thank you, David. All right, let me get started here. I'm gonna show you a little video to get things rolling and then we'll uh, do a little chat and talk and I'll explain more. Photography on the water is all about capturing the excitement of the moment. Be in front of them, that they come right past us. The harder it blows, the wetter it gets, the bumpier it is, the harder it is to get the shot. You know, sailing can be dangerous. People see themselves floating through the ocean with a pina colada and a palm tree in the background. But there's some hardcore racing out there. Probably blowing 20 to 30 knots here. The rig comes down, the sail blows out, somebody falls over the side. It's very exciting out there and we've got to catch that. I love shooting tight, 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 where all you see in the frame is boat and people and a little sail. Yeah, good, excellent. The, the image has got to look perfect. The color's got to be right. This is like a dance out here. What we're seeing video nowadays is more like a craft of filmmaking. It's beautiful colors. I find what we're doing with the DSLRs, the color 
and the look of the moving image is beautiful. The tools that I have now on the water with my EOS 1DX or whatever I'm using, a 5D Mark III, it's the tools that enables me to do my job. The versatility of this lens for doing this kind of work is just bloody perfect, you know? I think protection of the gear is obviously paramount, but what a point of having a piece of gear so protected you can't get to it to shoot with it, and Lopro has really nailed that. Snap that baby closed, let's keep the water out. The dry zone bags have been great. I've used them a lot. Obviously, I work on the water, near the water, in the water. It's constant. All the time, I've got to be careful that the, the gear doesn't get swamped. In the days of film, we would have 36 frames, and then you'd have to go down below and change a roll of film, and you'd expose the back of the camera to waves. And now we have these great, fast Lexar cards with the capability of accepting thousands of images. I mean, what a luxury. You just keep firing away. Oh, this is beautiful here. I just pop the four cards into the reader and it automatically downloads them all, boom, boom, boom. It's super fast, it's controlled, and I know which cards have been downloaded. I mean, how simple is that? There's a lot of excitement out there, and when everything comes together, you get that magic shot where you've got the crew member just grinding away or teeth clenched because he's cold, he's wet. There's a wave to come over the sailboat, and we capture the moment. This is the excitement of sailboat photography. <clears throat>
The challenge always with a boat that you get out on the race course amongst all these race boats is a driver. You have to have somebody that understands the sport and who better than my youngest son, um, who has helped me in various different ways, but he's a very keen sailor. He's a good dinghy sailor. Uh, he helped me shoot at the Olympics in Rio and so on. And here he is driving our boat on assignment and he just knows exactly where to go and where not to get us in trouble. The conditions on the water can be dry and beautiful here shooting with a 600 F4 or it's rainy and wet with a 200 to 400 with a 1.4 X built in. So gnarly wet conditions, but the gear deals, it handles it. And I'm not one to say, well, I've got to stop because it's raining. I want to get the shot. So I'll keep working. And the gear definitely can stand up to it. I mean, there's times when I get cold and miserable and I go in, but it's not because the gear can't handle it. One hand for the boat and one hand for the camera. So, um, you know, that's sort of how I make sure I stay on board. And then these are the kind of views that you get when you shoot down looking along the deck. And what I did in this shot is I put a little bean pod on the bottom of the camera called the pod. And I put the pod down on the rail, this teak rail here, which you can see. So I placed it here and then I did a slow shutter speed of you know, maybe half a second at F16. And so you get a little bit of movement in the water and you get a fairly nice effect. Then there's times when you look the other way and it's very wet and I end up putting the camera in an Aquatec waterproof housing with a 16 to 35 or a 15 to 35 millimeter Canon lens. And um, again, a little slower on the shutter, maybe a 10th, maybe a fifth and at, at F16 and try and get some movement going. There's times when I love to go down below and here, because the boat's heeled over because she's sailing, um, I got all the way into the bow of the boat and I was using my, my RF 14 to 35, uh, which gives a really nice perspective of what's going on down there while we're moving and banging along. And then you'd look up uh, through the hatch and see the guy getting the spinnaker ready and who is uh, hard at work on the foredeck. So people ask me, what's it like to get in a helicopter and go and shoot? So this is, gives a little, a nice little view of how it works. Helicopter, the tricks to shooting from a helicopter, especially with a longer lens of, let's say, if you're in the 200 millimeter range and beyond is to, to crank the shutter. Don't be scared to shoot a fast shutter speed, especially when you're new to using a helicopter. You're nervous. You're scared of spending all the money. Crank the shutter speed. Get that up to a thousand or whatever. But um, I learned fairly early on that don't shoot only wide angle stuff from the air, but, but use a longer lens as well. Um, this gives you a little idea here. I'm working with um, an, an R44, a Robinson 44 helicopter out of Florida on the West Coast and shooting an ad campaign for a boat builder. So we lined up these three uh, catamarans and um, the guys on the water shot me working and coordinating. So I have a two-way radio in the helicopter and all the guys on the boats have two-way radios that I can sort of coordinate and make sure everybody's going in the same direction and the same speed. I mean, the more boats you put in the shot, the more complicated it gets, but that's what they want to do. So that's what you got to do. Shooting sailboats is the same thing. This is with a 300 millimeter lens. Um, and again, timing is key because these maneuvers start and end very quickly. That red sail, the spinnaker will disappear in within seconds. And I've got to communicate with my pilot through a headset and just tell him exactly where to be. So people ask, why don't you use the drone? I do use a drone. And here's my son helping me uh, with the drone early days with DJI. Um, you can see he's a bit younger here, but this is, uh, he was just so good at flying the drone and showing me how to use it because these kids play games all the time and they're sort of well-versed with using those little controllers. 
and a view of the boat show in Newport from the drone. Of course, you could never do this with a helicopter because you can't get this low. And then this is uh, some photography I did with a drone this past spring uh, down in the Carolinas. So it's a beautiful tool for when you're cruising on a boat like I am now and you, you don't have access to a helicopter and you want to do some shooting from aloft. I also enjoy shooting from in the water. So here I use an Aquatech housing and I put my R5 in the housing with a 14 to 35 millimeter lens. And I have a whole bunch of different techniques I use for that. Um, but that gives you a little idea of how to do it. My local driver in the Bahamas. And uh, also if I don't jump in the water, I can attach a pole to the camera. And then my right hand has a button beneath it, which you can see there's a little, little wire going to a switch over here. And then you can fire that. So let's say there's sharks in the water or it's really cold or it's dangerous, then I don't have to get in the water. But the, the, the perspective that you get with a waterproof housing, the Aquatech housing and the Canon lens, this is right on the water. As you can see, my camera is literally two inches off the water, but with that housing, everything stays beautifully dry. Then I'll jump in the water and swim around where the boats are racing. So here I'm obviously got the lens half under and half over. And I shoot it at least F-16 so that everything is nicely uh, in the same depth of field and all in focus. Same idea here in the Bahamas, uh, swimming around, shooting, um, trying to capture what it's like. What, what's what's the, the fish eye view of the actual racing? And of course, the kids, this was in Grenada. And I'd been shooting their older brothers racing and they loved seeing me swimming around with a camera. So they came and kept me company. So here's a little shot of a little film that I made to show you what it's like. I mounted a GoPro camera in the top of the mast. And this will give you a little idea of, of what, what the perspective is. Take it off quickly. Take it off? Yeah. I gotta, it's, too, it's too high here. Okay. Back up, back up. Thank you. Okay. So I out of a So I decided to switch off the audio in that little clip, but they're they're getting ready to sail. The camera's on the masthead. Look at the guy you're trying to catch up. He's a late guy. They're gonna grab him, grab him by the head, help him on board. Come on, you're late. Let's get going. So here they are. Six of them sailing along, lots of breeze. And you'll see it sort of goes a little pear-shaped here, but they're all hiking really hard to try and keep the boat flat. They're all sort of, they, they go inboard to balance the boat and then they've got to go outboard again. And of course, now watch, watch them as the boat goes over, watch the guy in the front. He's like, whoops, I'm out of here, goodbye. Um, this gives you a little idea of what the camera was seeing, the GoPro was seeing from the top of the mast. And um, it's kind of, now they have to take the, the sails down and tow the boat back to the beach and, and, and bail it out. But it's kind of a nice perspective. You see the guy dives down because he's got to undo some of the rigging and make the boat towable back to the beach. So here's a shot that I took of those guys doing the same thing and uh, ended up being Patagonia ran this in, in one of their catalogs. And they said, wow, that's such a nice perspective of the guys doing that thing. Um, I was lucky enough to shoot Jimmy Buffett's boat a couple of winters ago in Bimini in the Bahamas. Again, same technique, the Aquatech housing, with um, the Canon R5 in the housing. And um, I sort of control the whole show and the scene from the water shouting to the guys as they sailed by. Then we found a shallow spot in 10 feet of water, anchored the boat and had the model stand on the bow. And um, it just gives a nice above and below kind of perspective, um, something a little different that you don't get with a normal camera. I shoot ships as well. And of course, as the name say, says, these ships are large. It's all in bulk. Gives you a little idea of scale. Look at the size of this gentleman here standing on the bow. This was in Western Australia, uh, north of Perth, where I had to shoot this iron, iron ore carrier. Wonderful graphics. I just love working with ships and all that stuff. This is a, uh, a ship leaving Narragansett Bay or leaving Newport, heading out to sea. And as you can see, the bulbous bow here, this is a big, this gives you a little graphic schematic of what this is. And the pilot boat ready to get the pilot off. Back on the big ships, look at the size of the ropes. Everything is massive on these ships. Here is another ship 
taking an oil rig from Singapore to the Gulf of Mexico. And I was in a helicopter documenting the whole scene. But to put it into scale, you have a look and see how big this stuff is. It's immense. I mean, this ship is probably three, 400 feet long, 500 feet long. And she crossed the ocean. Uh, it takes her 30 days, you know, so long trip. And here's another view taken from a helicopter with a fisheye lens of a yacht carrier. And these were boats that carry yachts from Rhode Island all the way down to the Caribbean. That way people can get their boats down there safely and quickly. But before they load these boats up, they got to sink the ship down and the boats come on board and I would jump in the water to show how they would secure all these yachts on deck. And once all the stands are in position, they pump the boat empty. So here's another little project that I made a film of for a shipping company to show how they moved these big modules from China. So then I do a lot of powerboat shooting, small boats, large boats. It's really the, the bread and butter of my industry. And this is a fairly small boat of about 32, 33 feet, yet sells for about a million bucks or maybe just a hair there under. And so I do a lot of this type of work, boat, chase boat to chase boat, or uh, I get on board the boat or I use a helicopter. So again, a slow shutter speed here of about a 20th. And I hand hold a 24 to 70. And I love to have it at about 24 millimeters at F11. And like I said, a slow shutter speed anywhere between a 10th and a 20th. And I would say probably one in 10 pictures are sharp. The others are too bumpy. But when you do get them right, they're spot on. So this was late light. So obviously, you can see there's a little bit of late light still coming off the water from where the sun's going down. Same idea, slow shutter speed of about a 20th, handheld a, a 70 to 200 uh, from the air in the helicopter. And then details, they love the details to show the craftsmanship of their boats. So this is again with a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and probably shot at F2.8. So nice shallow depth of field and really concentrating on the craftsmanship. So here I, I was shooting a boat in Miami and put, there was a platform where I was able to put a, a, a tripod with a camera and I used a, a 14 millimeter lens with a long shutter of about three or four seconds and had the guy turn the boat from left to right. Hence all the lights of the building start getting those nice squiggles and jiggles. And again, somebody pounding along in heavy weather from the helicopter. And of course the lifestyle, you got to show the, the dream and you got to sell that. And again, with a shallow depth of field uh, with a 300 millimeter lens, um, I really focused on, on the, the people, on the models, on the talent and the boats, sort of a dream in the background. And then we go larger. This was a boat of about 195 feet, which I was shooting in St. Thomas. And this is the tender. So uh, that means that's the little motorboat that they run around in to take crew on and off and take guests around. And here I had my whole R5 kit and all the RF lenses, which I'm now completely into. I got rid of all the, uh, the DSLR working, doing mirrorless now. Little drone work just to get the toys at work. And then again, a drone shot at night uh, just to show the boat at anchor with all the lights up. But uh, just an incredible boat. This is the uh, command central here on a tripod. I'd shoot with my 14 to 35 and probably shooting at about 16 millimeters here. Uh, a slow shutter. You can see the background's blurring a little bit. So this was shooting Jimmy Buffett's boat on the interior in Bimini, um, again on a tripod. And, you know, I'm using these uh, Westcott uh, lights to try and get a little bit of light back into the cabin and light it up. That's a large boat master cabin. So this is where the owner sleeps, or we should say where he slums it. Just a beautiful accommodation.
and this is some of the artwork that they have on board. And I'd have to shoot everything, all the artwork, the cabins, the, the toys, the you name it. I'd spend four days shooting on the boat. And I had the boat to myself for four days in St. Thomas with a crew of 16. So um, it was quite a, quite a project. Same boat in St. Thomas. Again, late lights, the sun had gone, but there was still a little color in the sky. So I was able to um, sort of not get a black sky, but sort of balance it out. Champagne, anybody for champagne? Sushi. And again, shallow depth of field. I love that 24 to 70 at 28. That works beautifully. I also use my 70 to 200, the RF, the 2.8, which works beautifully for the shallow depth of field. And then we've got to show the toys being used. So here I was back in the water with the Aquatech. And this is my assistant. I said, hey, put some shorts on and let's go swimming. Let's shoot this, this spectacle. A classic boat being built in Newport. She's about 165 feet. And here the guys are fairing the frames and putting the, the first of the internal planks on. Again, shooting with a 14 millimeter lens. Back on the water, chase boat, good driver. You gotta watch where you're going because there's action everywhere. It's so easy to get run down because these guys, again, are probably running around at 25 miles an hour. Out to the Great Lakes in Minnesota. And these are the A-class scows, which is quite a debacle to watch these guys because they do, they capsize from time to time because they don't have a keel. They have a centerboard, but the weight of the crew keeps them flat. And off to the Bahamas where the locals do their thing working their way here in the, in the Exumas, in the family island regatta. Again, shooting with a long lens, 500 millimeter here, the 500 F4. Um, now I have the RF 400 28, and then I'll put a converter on that for, for future assignments like this. Beautiful colors, the water's great, the sky, the sails, uh, just an amazing place. And this is in Georgetown in the Exumas. So talking about depth of field, I mean, I've, as you've heard, uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of shallow depth of field. And this was shooting with a 400 at 28 and with lying on the dock on a small little floating dock, trying to really show some shallow depth of field. And then how would I use that in a shot? Look how shallow the depth of field is here. I've really focused on, on these boats here. You can see the foregrounds completely out of focus as is the background and shooting some of the old America's Cup style boats in Narragansett Bay. And of course, there's always somebody in the back of the boat here with an iPhone who's gonna be capturing what he wants to. I'd love him to sit down, but that's life. You can't control everything. This was testing some gear for Canon uh, years ago during the, uh, the World Championships of the Melgus 32. Lots of action as they come up to the mark and you've got to be in the right place and get the timing right. So fast shutter speed here, I would say at least 1500. And with an ISO, I would say probably in the 200 to 300 range and an F-stop of about probably four or five, six, pretty shallow. So this is my present day kit. Um, this is what I shoot with. So the backbone is three R5 mirrorless cameras. And then I have a 400 RF 2.8 the 100 to 500 RF and the 70 to 200 RF. And then I have, this is since gone, but now I've got everything from 15 to 35, 24 to 70. And these two EF lenses have now gone. So here's the Aquatech housing. I use SKB boxes and shipping cases and think tank and mind shift bags for my, my travel needs. And when I need to put you know, gear in a bag, and there's that little pod that I was telling you about. And these are my filters. Just a little touch on how much smaller the R5 is compared to the 5D, which is just wonderful. Lighter, easier to use. And why do we like to use mirrorless? Well, because there is no mirror and there is no mirror box. So that makes the camera smaller and more compact. And as the Canon designers from Japan told me, it makes for a better picture. So I believe them and I'm a firm believer. How do I travel around? Here's my SKB box. 
that has a whole bunch of my gear in it when I'm on the water. But when I'm traveling, I put clothes in it and I carry the camera stuff on. And then when I'm on the water, this is what it looks like. I put all the camera gear in the box and that way it stays dry and I can take out of the box what I need when I need it. And I use three bodies so I don't have to chop and change lenses and risk getting water in the camera. So these are all SKB uh, camera boxes. Because when you're working on the water, this is what you have. Lots of action and it's beautiful, but it's very wet out there. Again, same thing. This is taken in Antigua, uh, down in the Caribbean, where they have an annual classic yacht regatta, which is just wonderful shooting. But it's bumpy, it's wet, and it's hard work. Back in Rhode Island, shooting a little bit of action and freezing the action here with about a 2,000 shutter speed with a 500 millimeter lens. Off to Baja, and where they believe in cacti and sailing and uh, a little different to shooting in Rhode Island, but love it, what a difference. Here I'm shooting in, in Newport from my chase boat. And this is one of the boats they used in the America's Cup. And I'm concentrating on what these guys are doing on deck, but look at these guys, he's making another plan for the rest of his life, hopefully a wedding photo shoot going on on the shoreline in Newport at Castle Hill. So I always say to my driver, you know, they get concerned because they see somebody waving at us. Well, this guy's not waving at me to say hello, but he's shouting at me to get out of the way. And I always find that if I don't get shouted at two or three times in a day or in a race, I'm not doing my job and not getting in close enough to catch the action. Down in uh, Florida, this is in Miami, a little bit of action as the crew are hiking hard and keeping the boat flat. Beautiful color water. Down in Key West, the start sequence here. And again, with a long lens, shooting with a 200 to 400 at probably 400 millimeters as these guys, these guys prepare their start. And you can see this guy here is calling the time and the distance to the starting line for the owner. Back in the water, love swimming around. And when these guys come sailing close by, I snap away with my camera in the Aquatech housing. Key West. A bumpy day. Also Key West, but from the air. So what are some of my tricks to get good exposure? I am a big believer in using the highlight warning or, um, you know, this way, the, this, this area is, will flash black and white. And what it does is it tells you there you have lost the detail in the highlights. I, some people call it the blinkies. But this is the official word, the highlight warning, and that's in the canon in the menus. You can find it. And I so work with it that um, when I know when I'm working outside of the parameters of the of the sensor, the histogram is another piece of gear that I use with use religiously on the back of the camera. And it tells me what I'm doing with my exposure. And of course, this is a good histogram. This is too dark because you want to have some data in that fifth box. And this is overexposed because there's too much data in the right hand fifth box. So here you go. Here's an old um, menu which shows the highlight alert enable. Again, what does that look like? So this flashes on and off that black area. It says to you, you're blowing out the sky. So I'm just going to shoot, show you a little example of a raw file. And, and why do we want to shoot raw files? Well, there are many advantages, but obviously, and this was just a shot. I happened to have a very overexposed file. And I thought just for a laugh, I'm going to see if I can resurrect this file in Lightroom as a raw file. So here we're in Lightroom and I'm going to dial it down and see what comes out of it. And that's the result. So you can see from this to that. So you could never do that with a JPEG, but with a raw file, you can. Hand holding, testing a new camera. Uh, one of the earlier mirrorless cameras, I wanted to see what I could really do and how good the, the high ISO was. And I was here at five, 6,000 ISO hand holding and still very acceptable. This was the, the beginning of Sandy, Storm Sandy that approached New England a few years ago. Same idea. This is down at the, the Beaver Tail Lighthouse in Rhode Island. Here we were in Rio shooting for the Olympics. And uh, my son was driving chase boat for me. And these were obviously the top sailors in the world vying for gold medals in the, in the sailing 
discipline and this was the 470 class with the germans the french the finns and the canadians all going for it some aerial work here in rhode island uh showing the j class these are 150 foot sailboats racing for their world championships in newport and these boats originally were built in the 30s by the vanderbilts and people like that and uh obviously during you know after the second world war they sort of ended up stopped sailing those boats they were too expensive and went to smaller boats this is the america's cup from san francisco for a couple of years ago and uh was just wonderful shooting in that neck of the woods um very very fast boats these boats do 40 miles an hour plus so trying to keep up with them on a motorboat was very challenging i'd have to go on my knees on the motorboat to sort of be able to stand upright and not fall over the side Big boats down in St. Bart's. Uh, this is called the St. Bart's Bucket, a very popular event for the, the, the rich and wealthy and famous people go down there and race their, their sailboats. Crew of 30, that's what it takes to keep these guys, these boats moving and, and safely operated. So I've shown you a bunch of racing and I'm gonna show you a little bit more and sometimes I think maybe it's more fun shooting different stuff. And this is, you know, expedition or cruising or going to different parts of the world and not shooting racing, but really doing some leisurely exploring on, on the sailboat. So this is flying to the Bahamas to go and cruise with my boys on a small boat. And we were approaching the Exumas here and I was lucky I had a very clean window that I could shoot through with my uh, DSLR at the time. So this gives you an idea of some of the scenery that we had in the Bahamas. And this is our, it was a small 30 foot plywood catamaran and we slept on deck and it was all pretty basic stuff. I mean, dinner consisted of an apple, I mean, an orange for dessert, some sausage and a potato. And that was it. There was three boys and myself. And um, it was just an amazing expedition. Wonderful stuff to just be on our own in the middle of nowhere. We didn't see a soul for days on end. And you can see it's shallow there, very shallow, two, three feet. And if the boat ran aground or we wanted to do, pull up somewhere and go ashore, we could just put the boat on the beach and with a bit of a shove, we'd get it back in the water again. And what about washing? Well, you just grab a bottle of Joy wash your hair and dunk it in the ocean. And that was it. It was very basic living on board. We slept on deck, we ate on deck, we just did everything on deck. There was no real accommodation down below. Here we are, younger brother watching older brother burn the sausages. <laughs> Things are pretty normal. The, the wildlife there was great. These small iguanas on the beach made for good photography. Again, shallow depth of field here. I had a 300 to eight with me which was wonderful for this type of work. And then of course, the sugar birds were easy to coax into Adrian, my youngest boy's hand. And so with a shallow depth of field and a fast shutter speed, I was able to freeze the action here. We loved exploring, and this was an old drug plane down near Highborn Key, also in the Exumas in the Bahamas. And these guys came short, they landed in the wrong place or crashed, I should say. But we were lucky enough to know where the, where the plane was and with our boat, we anchored close by and swam over to uh, explore the wreck. Kind of like James Bond, it felt like. So this is early morning shooting in South Africa. Uh, my keen sandals on and my little think tank backpack. And of course, we're looking for good scenery. This is sunrise on the west coast of South Africa. Uh, with my uh, 14 to 35 RF lens shot pretty much at 14 and probably at about F11 and an ISO of probably about 200 and a shutter of maybe a 60th or something like that. Antigua and Nelson's dockyard, just what a scene. And this was on a tripod with my 24 to 70 and uh, a nice long shutter speed because I was on the tripod, so it didn't really matter. And the lighting of the day was key. You want to catch it before the sun goes down all the way that you still have a little bit of color in the sky. This is also in the Caribbean where one of the locals would come by in the morning and uh, sell us fish. 
and uh, would obviously buy a tuna like that, fillet it, slice it up, and put it on the barbecue. It's a tough life. Near the Tobago Keys, which is uh, near St. Vincent in the Caribbean, and we came across these turtles, which were just fairly tame, and they love to eat the seagrass here. And we could go diving and swim with them and take pictures. And again, this was with my Aquatech housing with my 15 to 35 millimeter lens. Baja in Mexico. I guess nowadays you'd shoot this with a drone, but in those days we did a bunch of hiking and it was just nice to get up there. You can see here's our little tender, this little boat here, and this was our catamaran. And we'd hike all the way up and hang out and take a snack with us and take some pictures. The locals selling fish. Early morning, shallowed at the field. I've done a lot of work up in the, uh, the high latitudes, or in other words, in, in the, the areas where there's ice, up north and down south. So the Arctic and the Antarctic. And this is sailing to the island of South Georgia at about 55 degrees south latitude. So not far from Antarctica. And this was approaching that same group of islands, but we came across this beautiful big iceberg, which is hundreds of feet high. And these birds are probably have a wingspan of about 24 inches. So you get an idea that the iceberg is massive. I shot all this with a 400 to eight. Here we are down in Patagonia uh, and the boat, boat is not quite stuck in the ice, but moving slowly, which I thought was beautiful to capture. This is over in Kamchatka in uh, Russia, which is Eastern Siberia or the Kamchatka Peninsula. And uh, a bunch of salmon in land, in a landlocked in a, in, a, in a pond here. And I was able to get my fisherman buddy to, uh, to cast his fly while I dunked my, my camera in the Aquatech housing uh, to capture the action as these fish were moving around. As soon as the tide came up, the fish would get out and they were gone. Just a little close up of one of the humpbacks that we caught on the fly. Exploring in Vanuatu and back in Greenland. I've done a bunch of workshops in Greenland and what an amazing place to explore. This is all on the east coast of Greenland. And this is up near uh, north of Norway in Svalbard or Spitsberg at 80 degrees north latitude, where I was in the top of the mast. They hoisted me up there and I could shoot looking down with my 14 millimeter lens. You see lots of depth of field here. I must have been shooting here at F11. This was a Greenland trip a couple of years ago, and I was documenting the whole adventure for the owner of this boat, which is um, about 90 feet. And so I spent two weeks there poking around. We had a nice little tender so I could get off and show what everything looked like from off the boat. The Southern Fulmar, uh, lots of these birds there. And again, I was shooting here with a 600 F4. Fast shutter. And you've got to watch what's going on with the exposure because this probably balanced out quite nicely. But if you have a lot of white, you've got to override the meter and sort of go plus one, maybe something like that. Same thing here. It was blowing like stink. And um, I really couldn't shoot looking into the wind. And this light was so dramatic as the squall passed through over this iceberg. Many penguins. This is all down in South Georgia. And the birds are very tame there. So you can spend a lot of time sitting there. Uh, I used a 300 to eight. So that way I wouldn't disturb the birds. I could sit in one place and they would just carry on with their own lives and really didn't care about what I was doing or what I was up to. This is all in the island of South Georgia, which is at 55 degrees south latitude. And we spent five weeks down there exploring. And this was home. This. 80 foot sailboat. So that was our base. And from there, we'd go climbing and hiking and shooting this remarkable island that was 200 miles long by about 25 miles wide. Same area. We were exploring with a dinghy and these penguins, these chin strap penguins were there. Little timing, catch the wave. Again, a fast shutter speed, freeze the action. 
also in South Georgia. No light here. It's a very gray day, but that really brings out the blueness of the iceberg and Mr. and Mrs. Penguin hanging out watching us as, as we went cruising by. A black-browed albatross. Uh, they were on nests there, so we were able to sit for a while and watch them while they were, you know, sitting on the eggs or they'd come, they'd fly in and from a feeding foray and uh, feed their chicks. Again, with a 300 to 8. Elephant seals. Huge animal, thousands of pounds. And this was incredible to watch the wandering albatross doing his courtship dance. And I wish I could have sound for this and maybe a little smell as well to really give you the whole experience. But he thought she was pretty cute. And, um, you know, I was sitting in one little spot with my 24 to 70 millimeter lens and the, the, the wing of the bird was touching my head. And I started about 30 feet away, 40 feet away. And he just sort of worked his way over to where I was and didn't really care that I was there. So I do workshops as well. And I love to get a group of anywhere from six to 12 students and we take them out on the water and um, show them, sort of give them an idea of how it's done, what kind of gear to use, the shutter speeds, the angles, and I make sure we go in the right place. This gives you an idea of what it's like shot from the flybridge and following one of these sailboats pretty closely, obviously with a super or the fisheye lens, a little distorted, but enough to show you what we were doing and how close we get. Here's a little video of how it goes in one of my workshops. So a lot of times people will have never been on the water at all. So for them to get on a boat like this, that's very comfortable with drinks and food and a proper toilet and so on. And then I walk around the boat talking to everybody and saying, you have any questions? Can I help you at all? What do you think? That's how we do those workshops. And that works beautifully. I have a workshop um, in Newport three, four times every summer. So get, a, get in touch with us. And this is our headquarters. The, the gallery on Bannister's Wharf in the heart of Newport. And of course, we do all our own printing on our Canon printers and Canon paper and Canon ink. So um, it's, um, here's a little view of our gallery. So you get an idea of what we have, how we present things. And my wife, Tenley, runs the gallery. It was her idea to start the gallery. And she picks the images and she runs the printer and picks the papers and the frame styles and has since then branched out into iPhone cases and posters. And we have a whole slew of all kinds of other photo related products that sell very well. Um, as you can see on the table, we've got a couple of coffee table books that I've done. And then this left hand corner is where we have the smaller prints that um, some people prefer something a little smaller, not quite so big. And so we have everything for, um, you know, everybody's budget. So it's a, it's a great setup. We get a lot of walkthrough traffic and it's a wonderful um, additional income to my assignment work. Plus, you know, my workshops, of course. So this is a 36 by 54 stretched canvas of Skilcha. It's a Dutch built boat that I shot down in the Mediterranean a couple of years ago. And I think the unique thing about this shot, it was shot late in the day, the sun's already gone down, there's some lights on in Monaco and Nice and the area along the shoreline. But you can see the movement in the water. And what I ended up doing was I put the camera down on the rail and took a nice slow shutter of about a half a second or a quarter second. And that gives it the movement, but the boat itself is nice and sharp. And you can see the movement in the running backstay and in the sails and all that stuff. So it's kind of a nice perspective and something great to hang on your wall. It's a little sales pitch. That's what we put on the websites so that people know what we're selling. Uh, here's another very popular shot from the gallery, an aerial of our second beach in Newport, Rhode Island, taken with a helicopter. And a project I did for Canon 
uh, with the 15 to 35 RF lens. They said, let's see what you can show us. And we want to sh show it at Photo Expo. So this was on a, on a tripod with the R5. And um, I would say this was probably about two or three second exposure. Late in the day, the sun was gone. And of course, there's a little light going on in the lighthouse. Nice light, a little scene from Newport and the bridge. Timing is everything in this type of work. You know, I can't set up a studio with lighting. I've got to wait for, you know, the light to happen for me. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And here a big storm was moving through. And just before it all blacked out and started raining, the sun popped out and we had some beautiful imagery to work with. I've done a few books with Rizzoli. Uh, this is the second one called Sailing America. And the first one, Sailing, was about sailing from all over the world. And these are, you know, big multi-page seven, seven pound coffee table books that have sold incredibly well. Wonderful working with Rizzoli, great, great uh, publisher. I tucked into some video work. I've shown you several videos and I still do video work. Now um, I made, a, 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 you know, how do you go about going into video and not having any samples? So what I did is I made a documentary um, myself to put on my website that people could see, yes, he can shoot video. So that's what this is all about. It started out as a summer job, really. My father was a fisherman, my grandfather. Actually, both sides, of, um, my mom's side too, there was a lot of fishing. I started mending nets and um, they were shorthanded one day, so I jumped on the boat. This was all shot locally in Rhode Island by the trap boats, so these. On the way out to the, it's actually a, kind of a bonding moment among the crew in the morning. You know, it's first thing, the day hasn't started yet, so that is actually a time for sort of storytelling amongst the crew and um, sort of quiet time before we actually get to the trap and jump on the boat. We, you know, we catch up, laugh about stories, stupid stuff that happened the day before. Every spring we kind of have an idea that we're going to get this, this scup run. So we had the same people that um, probably were around when my grandfather um, was fishing. It's, it's a definitely a team effort and when we're out there everybody has to work together because one little mess up it can just drive the fish down and rip the net right out of your hands. When you see the boil of fish, you, I mean, you get excited from the first time you, you put your hands into the net and you just see that little boil. We're bringing up the bottom of the net and that's what's rising to the surface. They are just trying to find a way out. You know, you're stepping on the net, you're bringing fish up, you're stepping on it with all your weight and the twine is going back out because the, the weight of the fish. They are swimming in circles and they're just trying to find the weakest link. <laughs> and the corners can be the weakest link because if you let the corner down, they swim, they get behind you on the boat. So this, you have to get that corner up and there could be 100,000 pounds of fish pushing into that corner and you just want to keep that wall of, of twine up so they, they can't get by. think there is no way that we can get all these fish. I feel just good at the end of the day. I've, I've been outside all day. I've exercised, not in a typical fashion, but um, I've done something. I feel exhausted at the end of the day in a good way. I'm proud that I can 
feed a million people a year. Um, the utmost respect for, for the ocean and the fish that I, I take and um, I just, I think every day I watch the sunrise and think how lucky I am to be part of it. So that was my first attempt at shooting film and making a little documentary, and that really helped me get a lot of work. So it was fun creating that. The next project that I did through being able to show people that I could make films was documenting the build of a hundred foot ocean racing yacht. And that was all in video. And I did some stills later on, but this gives you a little idea of, of how I had progressed in my filmmaking. The first time I, I saw Comanche's Hall, I remember kind of peering over the apron down into this shed. And I remember looking down and just going, oh my God, what have we done? It's massive. This is part aircraft carrier. My name is Ken Reed. I'm the skipper of the boat. My job is to hire all the best guys I possibly can and create something like this. Jim Clark had been talking about this for a while. He got caught up in it and he and was all of a sudden all of his buddies were egging him on to build a hundred footer and he obliged. His operation has to fulfill his very competitive ambitions and, and trust me, he is as competitive uh, as any person I've ever been around in my entire life, as is his wife Christy, by the way. The two of them combined, there's no messing around. If you do it, you do it right. The build team that we assembled and who really ran the build up at Hodgson are the best of the best. The shapes and sizes and tolerances that these builders are building to now is nothing shy of unbelievable. Tim Hodgson and the whole Hodgson team, they lengthened buildings, they built ovens, they bought ovens. They wanted to look not just at this project, but they wanted to look at carbon fiber manufacturing well into the future. The back of the boat is 25 feet wide. It's just stability, purely stability. The more stability you get from the hull form, the less you have to do as far as weight in the keel, so lighter boat. Secondly is mass placement. Design services at North Sales, they started running drive force coefficient. So the mass would start, let's say, just four to 50%, which is way up here. And then he put it back a meter, and he came back to us, and to paraphrase, it's better. Put it back a meter, it's better. Put it back a meter, it's better. In essence, he kept going until it started getting slower. This is more of a traditional multi-hull position than it is a mono-hull position. Every sail here is carbon fiber. Everything you see above the deck is carbon fiber. It's what carbon fiber allows you to do, and it's nothing shy of spectacular. The adrenaline rush, it, there's nothing like it. You know, goggles on, blasted with water, guys holding on. You down below and it's like Armageddon. The slamming and the sounds down below it, it is a completely different animal. It's far more like a race car than you would ever imagine. It's literally at high speeds, two fingers, and a tiny little movement, and you can really make the boat respond. What this thing can do in front of eyeballs on Sydney Harbor, hopefully on Boxing Day. That tells a story that lasts forever, and hopefully that attracts more people to our sport. Well, that was quite a boat to document, and she went on to break many records and is still probably one of the fastest sailboats out there. Uh, I ended up getting covers and spreads, and the, the whole film was very well received. Uh, here you just get a little idea of what I've done over the years. Many, many sail covers, sailing, boating, all types of various different publications. 
So what am I doing now? Well, I'm actually doing this, this presentation from this boat, uh, Snow Goose, that you see. I'm actually in the water and in Norfolk, Virginia, heading south towards the Bahamas. Uh, I've done most of the work myself, fixed the boat up, and uh, people have been documenting it and are very curious to hear what we're doing, where are we going. Um, this is the boat in the water, still in Rhode Island, while we're doing trials and getting things fixed up. And um, this is the interior. We, uh, my wife redid the interior cushions and I re-varnished and thought this is going to be a great platform to shoot from. Of course, my wife enjoys a quiet cocktail in the evening at Anchor. Um, but for me, you can see my gear here. This is a perfect place to shoot from. This is the top deck. This is approaching Cuddy Hunk uh, in the northeast going towards the vineyard and then tuck it. But I've done a lot of photography. I have a, an SKB box here with my gear with two bodies and, and several lenses and a nice place to shoot from. Nice cover of the boat. So publicity is rolling. And uh, inside, they like the fact that I did a bunch of the work myself. And there was a whole story about how we did things. Where are we going now? Well, I'm documenting the whole trip of the, the, you know, the whole trip. And I started in Rhode Island up here, down the Jersey Shore, up the Delaware, down the Chesapeake. And now we're in Norfolk, Virginia. And tomorrow we start this trip down the intercoastal waterway and we'll work all our way down towards Savannah. Uh, for Christmas. And then in the new year, we go this far down to Miami and across to the Bahamas. So this is a little list of what I use. This is the current gear list of all my equipment. There's obviously bits and pieces more, but this is the backbone of it. And if you guys and gals are interested in following along the boat trip, my photography, I'm doing films, uh, I'm posting things on YouTube, uh, on Instagram or Facebook. There's all kinds of good stuff to follow. I talk about photography. I talk about the boat. I talk about the local people I meet. So there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, to follow along. So that's the end of my presentation. David, thank you for having me. Canon, thank you for putting me on. And I hope that it was of interest to you guys. I'll go back to the previous screen. Uh, and I don't know if there's any questions, but um, let's see what you guys want to ask me. Otto, that was uh, that was amazing. That was a, a super cool presentation, and especially climaxing in that amazing boat in the end. And I don't mean the the really fast sailboat. I mean your boat, the, the your boat, right. the Snow Goose. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I have to say, the one shot of it you kind of shot a little back. It sort of looked like the orca from Jaws. <laughs> well let's say it's a, it's a design of an old fishing boat so it could be <laughs> okay We're, i don't think you're gonna need a bigger boat she's she's beautiful and good luck on your Thank trip so you. i've got some questions you. for you and uh we've, we've yeah. looked through a, a few questions here so let's run that down um okay first one was uh you had uh, there was a shot uh, early in the presentation where you laid the camera down on the teakwood deck, and then you had a beautiful motion blur of the ocean. Yet the boat was was sharp. Uh, can you uh, uh, DM Fimpa uh, is asking if you can comment on how that action blur of the water uh, while you maintain the stillness of the deck? How'd you do that? So you have to basically lock the camera to the boat so you can do that with a tripod or with a little bean bag or whatever so you have to make the camera and the boat one so that there's no more movement between the camera and the boat yet anything else that moves is going to be blurry because you i had a half a second and some of the shots i did one second of exposure um so then you get that beautiful silky looking water with all that motion blur okay pretty cool thank you very much this is a yeah. uh, two questions regarding uh droning which I think is really interesting because when we tested out your presentation earlier and you showed the helicopter work, I kind of crunched my eyebrows together and said, gee, a helicopter work, right? probably doing droning. And then of course you fully embrace a drone. So yeah. the uh, the question is, is uh, have you gotten the same, but this is from uh, Perono Marine Electronics. Do you think you can get the same quality photo from a drone versus a helicopter? Well, I don't think you can um from a 1500 hundred dollar drone you know if you get a forty thousand dollar drone then i think you can but i'm not in that league and on my boat and the way i work so but there are times when you want to show you know the view from up high 
let's say you're in a remote part of the Bahamas and all you have is the drone, it'll work. And I take, I shoot those in DNG format with the, with the drone and I put them in Lightroom. I tweak them and then I up them and they become very acceptable and you can do covers and spreads with it. Look, it's nothing like an R5 from a helicopter, obviously, because that's a massive file. That's a 50 megapixel file. So it's very hard to compare a mirrorless R5 with a drone but they're acceptable. The drone file you know, is, is totally workable. I've been playing with a, with a drone for the past couple of years and they, they blow me away. They're amazing. And I, I like what you said, they're, they're acceptable. I think you can make shots with a drone that you just couldn't make with an R5 or another, another platform. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a yeah. big advantage. It's an amazing tool. So I, this is a question that hasn't asked from the, from the crowd, but I want to ask you, I've been, been thinking about this one. Uh, when you doing drone work, uh, the RTH, the return to home feature, or if you're on a boat that obviously moves and you launch your drone from the boat, what's your thoughts on droning from a boat platform? So obviously, if the boat is anchor, RTH uh, is fine. And it's, if there's a problem, it'll come back to the deck and land. But a lot of times you're moving. And so I have to continuously update RTH all the time. And um, yeah, it's, it's very stressful flying a little drone over the water. It's one thing in a field or in a forest or something. If something goes wrong and it freaks out and it crashes, well, you walk over to the field and grab it. In the water, when something goes wrong, it's gone. It's over. It's goodbye. You're tearing up $1,500 bills and all the shots that you got. So I find it very stressful, but it's worth it because the results are just so amazing. And, and how do you contend with the... Uh with the sail, like when you're bringing the, the drone back in or taking off the drone with the sails, you have a strategy for, for those big obstructions that are potentially in the drone's path? Um, it's harder from a sailboat, obviously, because you have rigging and sails and ropes and shrouds and spars and all that stuff. Whereas with my motorboat, I can just take off from the back deck. My back deck is wide open. It's a teak deck. I put it down. I hit the takeoff button, whoop, and it hovers up to about six feet. And then I go outboard and I'm gone. And the same for landing. Actually, with landing, I do it differently. I bring the boat very close. I bring the, and this is when I'm at anchor. Um, I, I bring the drone to within an arm's, an arm's length. I grab the drone. And then with the other hand, I shut the drone down. So that's how I do it. So I catch it when it lands and I let it take off from the deck. And which drone are you working with now? I have the DJI uh, S, F, whatever it is. I can't even remember the model number, okay. but I've, I've had it a couple of years. I mean, it's it's basically, it's a $1,500 drone and it has a nice little, I think it's a Hasselblad, you know, camera okay. and um, a 20 megapixel still file. I do many, much more stills with it than I do video because I'm just not that good at getting the motion and all that stuff. If I need that, I hire people, young people to do it for me. Okay, the anchoring is that you're doing takeoff and, <laughs> and landing when you're stationary, so you don't you don't chase the drone exactly. into the uh, into the back deck. You know, a, a trick that always freaks me out when I see people doing it. But if they, when you catch the drone, if you turn it upside down, it theoretically turns off. So you can ah, I've never <laughs> try tried playing that. with that. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome work with the drone. Okay, okay back to uh, traditional photography. You st uh, this is from. Uh, DM Finpa as well. Uh, you stated you got rid of all your DSLRs. What have you found are the trade-offs, if any, now that you, you basically made a 100% uh, transition over to mirrorless? Uh, do you have any, do you ever run What is the regret? downside to switching from DSLR to mirrorless? Um, besides, you know, sorry, I, you, you, you were breaking up a little bit there. I wonder if my connection's a little weak, but. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can, yeah, we got you good. So uh, basically your, your observations about moving from, from a DSLR to mirrorless. Yeah, we have a little glitchy uh -oh. connection here. We can we can hear you good. Everybody at uh, at home watching this, mind you, that uh, Anna is on board a boat in a marina. So. Okay. So shall I explain? you? Question but, uh, is, is the... Uh, yeah, do you have any it's regret? become a little glitchy. I don't know if it's my my link between the boat and I think we lost you on that. Nope. And we've lost on signal. 
Let's give him a second, see if he can connect back in. Uh, if not, that was an amazing presentation and we're a little bit after three o'clock. So we've we've done our one hour webinar and um, hey, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone next week. If you can't make it, you can always catch the live stream and watch that. But we are expecting a, a robust show. It's going to be tons of fun and, uh, you know, really we're bringing a lot of B&H people out to Monterey, and probably one of the best parts is, is that we're just really looking forward to meeting all our customers on the West Coast that we haven't met here. We've been doing Optic in New York City for, uh, we did uh, two uh, virtual and we did five uh, in-person events. We got to meet everyone in New York. Now we're coming out to California to meet our our friends in Monterey and the region. So I think we're gonna call this uh, webinar at this point. Uh, Everybody sends some great messages to on so we oh, what on is back. Yeah, I'm back. Okay. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you good now. So we're we're sorry, I don't know what happened. Yeah. It's all good. Just that the question was was that in your transition from uh to mirrorless a hundred percent, do you miss anything from DSLRs or are there any any regrets you have or any tips that you have? You know, I really don't. I love the fact that the gear is so much lighter, so much smaller. Um, it's This is not a sales pitch. I wouldn't have done it if it hadn't worked for me, but I sort of tiptoed into it. And eventually I said, this is for me. I'm going to sell all my EF lenses, buy RF lenses, and go to all R5. I've got three of them, and I just love it. Yeah, I'm sold. I okay. don't see a downside. Does it kind of blow you away when you're able to hit exposure compensation and actually see it on that screen in front of you? <laughs> Amazing. And I think that's also an incredible thing when it's really quite dark that you can look through the screen and you can actually see what's going on there and what your sensor is capturing. I love the fact that you're not looking at a mirror and optically, but you can see what the sensor is going to do and what it's going to capture. Huge. There's a lot of advantages to it. I think it's wonderful. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we're really running out of time. I just, just want to check one more. Right. Hold on one second. Um, okay, I noticed that you were working, uh, you showed some, I think it was more of the vintage video, but you had a large stabilizer under your, your lens. And uh, let me ask you now, do you still rely on that stabilizer tech or do you just rely on really the amazing in-camera and in-lens stabilizers now. So now I'm shooting video with the R5 handheld and of course with IBIS and with the in-lens stabilizing IS in the lenses. It's incredible how good that is. And I don't need that stabilizer. I actually sold it. So now I'm just doing everything with a simple mirrorless and um, keeping life simple. So easy to switch from still to video. Yeah, I remember when I was much younger looking at the photography magazines and seeing those gyro stabilizers and like, that's like a super piece of equipment. You know, it's not, they're not widely sold. You don't, you don't see the lot of them, but that's amazing how the new technology has just removed the need for that very specialized and expensive piece of gear. So that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Last yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, this is a, uh, a question on logistics. I thought was a good, a good question. And uh <clears throat> Okay, hold on. This is, uh, have you shot big waves like Nazair or Mavericks? This is from uh, 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 Garrison Penna. And it's, uh, have you shot big waves like Nazair or Mavericks? And how do you, uh, is there any tips you can give us for really shooting in rough seas? Well, I think I have shot surfing. I have shot stuff in South Africa, in Hawaii. Uh, and occasionally we get surf from hurricanes in Narragansett Bay. Or, I mean, I should say uh, around Newport on the ocean side. Um, and I have get a 600. I have a 400. I get a 600 um, and shoot with that either on a tripod or. And then the other way to do it is jump in the water with an Aquatech housing. But that's a whole different story. Uh, that's very tricky doing that in those big waves. But I would say it's between a drone and a helicopter and shooting from the beach with a long lens. That's the way that I've done it. OK, well, on a. Thank you very much for coming and speaking today and leading this webinar. I want to thank Canon for, for bringing you in as well. 
Uh, it's really good to see you again. And for everyone that missed anything, this is uh, simply going to be live. It's now you can watch it again if you wanted to. Uh, we have a link to it on the webinar section of the BH Optic West website. And uh, thank you so much. And we also want to wish you smooth sailing on your way down to the Bahamas. Well, thanks. We'll keep keep us keep an eye on where we go. Follow along on Instagram or on YouTube, and uh, you'll see where we go and what I'm shooting and how we're creating content. So, David, thank you. This has been great.